Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 179, Apologists on How God Can Die, Part 2. In Part 1, we heard from apologists who are trying to answer the objection, how could God die? This objection often comes from Muslims, but of course this question could come from anybody. Isn't God an immortal being? And isn't he incapable of losing his immortality? But if God is and cannot fail to be immortal... That just means he can't die. But now you're saying that God died. How can that be? Good question. In part one, we heard from some apologists who make up some clever moves and use some aggressive rhetoric, but who don't bring in a lot of the conceptual machinery from ancient small-c Catholic theology. In this part two, we're going to hear from some apologists who do make use of that conceptual machinery, both Protestant and Roman Catholic. And again, the anvil I'm using to figure out what their answer is, is a logically inconsistent triad of claims that are part of my presentation in Trinity's podcast episode 145. It's this triad of claims. One, Jesus died. Two, Jesus was fully divine, and three, no fully divine being has ever died. So again, that's not an argument, it's an inconsistent triad. Any two of them imply that the remaining one is false. So to be consistent, you can't accept all three. You can accept at most two of them. Any Christian is going to want to accept two of them because of scriptural teaching. The question is, which one are you going to get rid of? The first response is by a reformed blogger named Steve Hayes. On April 1st, 2017, he wrote a post called The Immortal Dies. And even though it was April 1st, it was not a joke. It was a serious attempt to refute my presentation in podcast 145. As always, Hayes is very long-winded. If refutations were measured by numbers of words, he would be invincible. So I'm going to summarize rather than read most of this. He says he's a dualist. Normally, a person consists of body and soul. I agree. But I didn't want my arguments in the presentation to presuppose dualism because I was talking to a group of Christians, most of whom were not dualists. So I don't think anything in my argument presupposes it, but I do presuppose substance dualism. I think it's the New Testament view. The reason I think this attempt to address the issues is better than the previous ones is because it actually does bring in some more of Catholic tradition, that the other guys are only presupposing, and they're just assuming that you don't know about it, basically. And he knows the tradition because he's a Reformed guy. However, he doesn't realize how controversial some of the things he's saying are. His fourth point is this. Human nature isn't something a human being is, but has. A human being is a concrete exemplification or property instance of a human nature. If we view human nature as an abstract universal, then to be human is to be a concrete particular. By concrete, I mean existing in space and or time. Right, so a human being is an individual. He wants to commit here to belief in universals. Fine. I don't believe in those myself, but uh, quite a few Christian theologians assume that there are universal abstract properties. So let's grant that human nature is an abstract universal. So what he's saying is that he understands a human nature to be a property of a human person. It's their essence, their essential universal property, humanity. However, in my view, and I think this is really decisively shown by Tim Paul in his recent book on incarnation, I had the privilege of interviewing him about this book back in episodes 143 and 144, Paul, in that book, shows that the framers of the ancient creeds thought that Jesus' human nature was a thing, an entity, an individual, a concrete being. Why do we know they thought that? Because they said it died. Because they said it, the human nature, got crucified. 
You can't crucify a property. What you can crucify is a human being. And that, I think, was their view, that the human nature was a human being. What they say it's not is a human person. And they end up giving a very technical definition of person. I won't go into it here. Now, Hayes isn't the only person who thinks that Jesus' human nature is a property, that is an abstract thing and not a concrete thing. There are a number of theorists who think this. This is one of the big divides in incarnation theory. They're not all saying the same thing. Some of them are saying there's one Christ with two natures, and both of those natures are properties. And the question is, can anything have both of those properties? The other side is saying that in the one Christ, there is a human nature in the sense of an individual human, and then there's a divine nature as well, and they're using nature concretely both times. Hayes' fifth point is that Jesus is a composite individual. That's pretty mainstream. They don't usually want to say that the divine and human nature are parts of Jesus, but they're something a lot like parts. He says, to be more precise, Jesus unites the divine Son, he's talking about the eternal Word, to a human body and rational soul, right? That's the human nature. A particular body and a particular soul. Okay, then he goes on a tear about just because we can't understand things doesn't mean it's impossible, doesn't, doesn't follow that it's contradictory. Well, sure, of course not, but I very clearly laid out three claims such that they can't all be true just as a matter of logic. And so which one is he going to deny? Is he going to deny that Jesus died? Is he going to deny that Jesus was fully divine? Or is he going to deny that no fully divine being has ever died? His point 10, he says, humans can die because humans have bodies. Humans are normally embodied agents. God can't die because God isn't biologically alive in the first place. By the same token, angels can't die because angels aren't biological organisms. As I define it, only a biological organism is capable of death. Well, you can use words however you want. That's fine if you want to use death to mean biological death. I don't think there's any contradiction in the idea of a non-biological but living thing dying. I don't think there's any contradiction in the idea of an angel dying. Dying, it seems to me, is just loss of one's normal functions. Yes, our normal functions are, to a large extent, biological. So he's saying God can't die, then he's either denying that Jesus died or that Jesus was fully divine. Is that right? Is he putting a stake down in the third claim that no fully divine being has ever died? It sounds like it right there. Let's keep going. In his point 11, Christ's human nature didn't expire on the cross. Rather, the body of Jesus expired. Human nature is more than a body. Human nature, as I define it, is a composite entity. Although Jesus died, he continued to exist in a discarnate state between Good Friday and Easter because he had and has an immortal human soul united to the Son. The death of Jesus did not dissolve the hypostatic union as both divine and human levels. Jesus continues to exist during the interim between his death and resurrection. When he says Christ's human nature didn't expire on the cross, he thereby contradicts several church fathers. When he says the body of Jesus expired, well, I thought Jesus expired. Is the body of Jesus expiring different, or does Jesus expire by his body expiring? I guess he clarifies slightly below. He says, Jesus died in the same sense that ordinary humans die. When a human dies, the body expires, but the soul continues to exist. Consciousness survives, the mind survives, personality survives. Okay, so to say his body died just means that he underwent normal human death. Okay, good, I agree. And if by human nature we mean a property, yeah, properties can't die, much less die on a cross. So he's just explicitly said that Jesus died, and he's just explicitly said that God can't die. And so, therefore, the way I define it, he's implying clearly that no fully divine being has ever died. Okay, so then he has to deny that Jesus is fully divine, right? He's put his stake down in the first and the third. He must be denying the second. But instead of following through, he decides to complain that I'm picking on a poor little hymn writer by using a line from a hymn in my talk. It was, "'Tis mystery all, the immortal dies." That's really not to the point. 
blah, blah, blah. Tuggy is tone deaf to the pragmatics of language, blah, blah, blah. Here's something relevant, though. Watts and Wesley are operating in the tradition of the communicatio idiomatum, the communication of attributes. Yes. Yes, exactly. Very important point. He continues, where what is true of either nature is true of their common property bearer. So, well, this topic of the communication of attributes deserves a whole podcast. This is the messiest can of worms, perhaps, in all of traditional Catholic theology. What Steve Hayes says there is kind of correct. He puts it in terms of properties, like the properties had by each nature are also had by the person whose natures they are. That's one way to put it. But is this a doctrine about properties or about predicates, that is, about terms? You might think it's fundamentally a doctrine about terms, what can be said about what. And then the view would be that any term that can be said of one of the natures can be said of the person. And in fully developed Roman Catholic presentations that I've seen, they forbid going from nature to nature, and they forbid going from person to either of the natures. So you can say a nature term also of the person whose nature it is. You can't take a term that applies to one nature and apply it to the other. And supposedly you can't take a term that applies to the person and apply it to one of the natures. So those are like the fully developed rules. However, if you look at old sources, Origen, Tertullian, Athanasius, Apollinaris, others, for them, the communication of attributes lets you take something that's strictly true of only one nature and say it of the other. So in their hands, it looks like a settled policy of obfuscation. The divine nature can't die, so the divine nature is immortal. But because of the hypostatic union, because of its mysterious union with the human nature, you can say the human nature is immortal. And you can also say that the divine nature died, even though it's immortal. Only the human nature can die. So it's kind of infuriating in that form. Moreover, I'm not sure that the fully developed rules make sense. I mentioned a minute ago that some people use Christ to refer to the two natures together without necessarily meaning to say that they're a composite, that they're a complex object. Yeah, but if you look at a lot of the ancient tradition, they're pretty clear that there is one person in the incarnation, but that person just is the eternal logos. It's the divine nature. Okay, but if the divine nature just is Christ, just is the one person there, then you should be able to go both directions with the predicates. You should be able to say anything that's true of the person, of the nature, and vice versa, if indeed they're identical. Okay, so is Christ a third thing in addition to the divine nature and the human nature, and now Christ is somehow composed of those? Or is Christ just another word, person word, for the Logos? It's a mess. In any case, as Tim Paul points out, the standard rules where you can take a term that applies to one of the natures and apply it up to the person whose natures they are, that's just going to directly imply what looks like a contradictory statement about that one person. So the human nature is mortal, and because of this rule, you can say that Christ is mortal. The divine nature is immortal. Because of this predicate transfer rule, you can say that Christ is immortal. So we just said that Christ is mortal and that Christ is immortal. Okay. Now, in my inconsistent triad, I'm just sidestepping this business about Christ, whether or not Christ is something in addition to Jesus. So I'm just talking about the guy who was observed to be nailed to a piece of wood over 2,000 years ago. And I'm just observing, didn't that guy die? Again, this communication of attributes business needs discussing. Is it only about predicates, or is it also about properties? Are there two kinds of predication here? I have a lot of questions about it, and also about how the doctrine changed over time. But just for now, I don't see how the communication of attributes doctrine is going to help with our inconsistent triad. 
When the Trinity's podcast returns, Hayes finally directly addresses the inconsistent triad. Moving on, Hayes wants to disagree about my angel thought experiment. I don't want to argue about that now. Suppose I'm wrong. Suppose that for an angel to lose its life would be to cease to exist. Let me grant that for sake of argument. Finally, a thousand words into the post or so, he brings up the inconsistent triad that I start with. We've just seen him explicitly say that Jesus died. We've just seen him very clearly imply that no fully divine being has ever died. So then he must be denying that Jesus is fully divine, right? He's on my side. Well, let's see. The answer is, for reasons I've already given, his triad is vitiated by an equivocation of terms. <sighs> equivocation of terms. Steve Hayes. I'm disappointed, son. You can't just say there's an equivocation of terms. You have to say which terms you have in mind, and you need to say what the two different meanings are. But I'll save you the trouble. There are not equivocal terms there. The terms are Jesus. That occurs twice. It means the same thing both times. We know who that's talking about. It says died twice. It means the same thing. It means losing all or most of one's normal life functions. It means that in the first and in the third. It says fully divine twice. It means the same thing. There are pairs of predicates there, but there is no equivocation. I think his idea is one I mentioned in the talk. He thinks, well, surely the two natures doctrine answers this somehow. Well, fine then, show me how. Don't just say that. Don't just smugly assume it. Show how the doctrine of two natures renders these three claims consistent. So not an inconsistent triad at all. And you can just say all three of them. That hasn't happened. What's happened is he's affirmed two of them, which imply the third is false. Then he backs off from making that move. Because given what he said, the odd man out is the claim that Jesus was fully divine. So he kind of just smugly assumes that he has an answer to this and he's not going to bother to say it. Yeah, what can you do? He says that I misread 1 Timothy 1 and 1 Timothy 6 as saying that the Father alone has immortality because what it says is that God alone has immortality. He says it doesn't single out the Father as God. Well, he needs to familiarize himself with New Testament usage of terms. When you see God, that's the Father, like more than 99% of the time, and when it's not supposed to be the Father, the context makes clear who it is supposed to be. You can see this usage everywhere in the New Testament, but one really obvious place is if you look at the start of every letter that's attributed to Paul in the New Testament. Paul always sends greetings from God and from Jesus, from the two of them. 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my loyal child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. He comes at the will, at the command of God and of Jesus. He sends them blessings in the name of God and of Jesus. And if you're wondering who God refers to, God the Father. But that's just normal usage, even if he doesn't use the phrase the Father. Look, his complaint that I'm misreading by reading the word Father when I see the word God in a text, look, how does he think it should be taken? 1 Timothy 1.17, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. What does he think is the reference of God there? Is it the Trinity? That's an anachronism. 
Nobody in the first century is using God for the Trinity. That's just a blatant anachronism. It's like talking about the internet in the 1800s. So it can't be that. No serious textual scholar thinks it meant that. Could it be the Father? Yes. How do you know? It says he's invisible. Also, we know that the Father is the only God. Could we be referring to the Son here? Absolutely not, because he says invisible, and the Son was visible. In the context, he's praising God for all that Jesus has done for us, because God was the one who sent him and empowered him and vindicated him. Again, who is the he alone who has immortality in 1 Timothy 6.16? It's not the Trinity, that's an anachronism. It's not the Son, because it talks about dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. Well, that wasn't Jesus, because we saw him. Is it referring to the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit doesn't appear in this context. So, yeah, it's the Father. It's the Father alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light. But as I said before, if he was talking about just plain old immortality rather than essential immortality, what he says there would be false that the Father alone has immortality, because the Son, after being raised and exalted, has immortality too. So he must be talking about essential immortality. In praising God, he's singling out some essential attributes, that in the fullness of his glory, he can't be seen, dwells in unapproachable light, and he is immortal. He's referring to God, that is the Father, who he invoked a couple of verses before when he says, in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus. Again, constantly contrasting Jesus and God. Of course, they work together, but they are two beings for Paul. Hayes seems to realize that he hasn't really done anything to show how those three are consistent, and so he hasn't really answered the thrust of my argument. So he says a little bit more about how, in his view, the two natures are relevant to this question. He says, what it means to die relative to his human nature is that his body died. His soul was decoupled from his body. Right, but for a human's body to die is for that human to die. So this is just again to agree with the first statement that Jesus died, and we have left standing his agreement with my claim that no fully divine being has ever died. Right, well, those just directly imply that Jesus is not fully divine. Problems still sitting right there on the table. Again, he doesn't say that the human nature died. Now, in the course of the discussion, I mentioned this interpretation of natures as beings, where the human nature is a kind of thing that can die on a cross, and then the divine nature is another being which can do things like work miracles and forgive sins. The church fathers are very explicit about these two claims. Hayes jumps in here with a bit of mockery. Tuggy reverts to his hobby horse about whether it's coherent to posit two selves, one person. He says that when you read the Gospels, Jesus didn't flip a switch by talking in one voice, then talking in another voice. But as a matter of fact, when we read the Gospels, Jesus makes statements, or the narrator makes statements about Jesus, or normative characters and foil characters make statements about Jesus that are incompatible with Jesus either being merely human or merely divine. Okay, but as a Reformed Christian, then Hayes agrees with the statements of the New Testament, and so he thinks it's just obviously implying that Jesus is fully divine. That's just to put a big old exclamation point on this problem. It looked like so far he was affirming that Jesus died, and affirming that no fully divine being has ever died, and then he must be denying that Jesus was fully divine, but nope, he's affirming that Jesus was fully divine. So, he's just affirming an apparent contradiction, which is that an essentially immortal being died. He believes this because he thinks the scripture teaches it. The problem with that is that it's uncharitable to the scriptural authors. We're taking them to be confused if we read them as saying that Jesus is fully divine and he died. But they're not confused. They don't think that he's divine in the same sense that God is divine. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, Jesus dies. God can't die. Second of all, Jesus explicitly says he doesn't know something. God can't fail to know something that's true. 
Jesus goes around asking questions. I don't think he's faking it. I think he really is asking for information. Jesus is tempted. You can't tempt God. He's essentially good and essentially all-knowing. You can't get a hook into him. There's no way to make it seem like a good idea to God to do something bad. He can't have that type of desire. It's impossible. Jesus is tempted to do something wrong, but he comes through with flying colors. Jesus is subject to God. He obeys God. He represents God to people. He talks to God. God, in the New Testament, is Jesus' God, explicitly, in multiple authors, multiple times. No, Jesus isn't fully divine in the New Testament. He is fully divine in Catholic tradition. And so, this is a clash between Catholic tradition and the New Testament, rightly understood. Like I said, Hayes is not short of words, though. He says... Tuggy says that according to the two natures doctrine, Jesus had two selves. One died and one lived on. Again, that's what the church fathers say. They say the human nature died. Hayes continues, but that's inaccurate. The rational soul of Jesus didn't cease to exist. Even if for the sake of argument we use Tuggy's two self rubric, both selves survived the crucifixion. A human being is not reducible to his body. Well, we're all dualists here, bro. Nobody asserted that Jesus' soul ceased to exist. I didn't say that. The church fathers didn't say it. But let's not confuse dying with ceasing to exist. Oddly enough, he seems to know this. He says, If humans are a union of body and soul, then to say a human dies just means the body dies. That, however, doesn't imply that the human decedent ceases to exist. Right. It doesn't imply that. I agree, Steve. What you've just said is that a human dying is the same thing as a human's body dying. Right. So then if Jesus' human body died, that just is to say that Jesus died. Okay, but then if a fully divine being can't die, then Jesus was not fully divine. But this is the solution that he can't take because he's committed to small c Catholic traditions. That's all he's got. He's got the pseudo-solution of just foolishly affirming all three. He's got the real solution of denying the second one, that Jesus was fully divine, but he withholds taking that. He's got the vague idea that somehow the two natures doctrine shows how these three could all be true, but unsurprisingly, he's unable to show that. What's he got left? At the end of his post, he just flails with some insults like he's wont to do. I'll skip those over. I'll give him this much credit. He is thinking about it. He is going places that some other apologists refuse to. Keep thinking, Steve. When the Trinity's podcast returns, does a Roman Catholic apologist do better? This apologist's name is Carlo Broussard. He's with Catholic Answers. And the second guy you'll hear talking is Cy Kellett, who's the host of Catholic Answers Live. Here's the question and the answer. I was discussing with a few friends of mine uh, last time about uh, Trinity, God, Jesus. Some of them were Muslims and some of them were only Jesus. Okay. So when we were talking about Trinity, um, about Jesus, being fully God and fully human at the same time. They came up with this question. So when you say Jesus died on a cross for three days, do you mean God died? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's such a good question. The church yeah. struggled with it for the first, what, 300 years of the life of the church. Let's stop right there for a second. That's not correct. They didn't struggle with that for 300 years. There's no hint of this struggle in the New Testament. There's nobody in the New Testament that pops up and says, wait a second, Jesus is God. How could God die? God can't die. 
nor do you see conversations like this happening in the 100s and the 200s. And the reason for that is they didn't think that Jesus was fully divine or that required essential immortality. They thought increasingly as time went on that he was divine in some sense, but that was a sense consistent with his dying. But they continue. Yeah, and it all depends on whether or not Jesus is God, right? And and that statement itself has to be nuanced. Distinctions, distinctions, distinctions need to be made, BB. So the short answer to the question, did God die on the cross when Jesus died on the cross? The answer is yes, okay? But <laughs> we have to understand what we mean by God died on the cross. Does that mean God went out of existence? Obviously not, because everything in existence is continuing in existence. So the Almighty, the sustainer of all being, all things that exist, continue to exercise uh, his will to sustain things in existence. Now, because Jesus has the same infinite Almighty will and intellect as the Father and the Holy Spirit, when Jesus experienced human death, he was using that divine will to sustain everything in existence even though he was experiencing death, namely the separation of soul and body. And you see, B.B., what's important to understand, once again, a distinction to be made, is that Jesus had two natures. What does that mean? He had two sources of operation. He could experience things that go with being God, because he had the divine nature with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he could experience things that go with being a human, because he had a full human nature, including he could experience the human experience of laughter, joy, all of the human emotions, even anger, righteous anger, I might say, and even suffering and even death. He could experience hunger and thirst. Everything that humans experience, given their human nature, Jesus was able to experience as well. The second person of the Blessed Trinity having this experiential knowledge of human experience, even experiencing death, the separation of the body and the soul, and that the Word, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, in a mysterious way was present both to body and soul in that separation. Notice that two times he said that death is simply separation of body and soul. I think it's more than that. I think it's loss of normal life functions, all or most of them. If somebody has an out-of-body experience, you don't say that they die in having an out-of-body experience. Let's assume that those really occur, okay? Dualism is true, and people, by whatever means, can somehow get outside their body and fly around disembodied. If they do that for five minutes, they're not dead for five minutes. They haven't lost those normal life functions, apparently. Apparently, they're still breathing. There may or may not still be some brain activity there. It's just that they're not hooked up with their body in the normal fashion. Okay, but let's hear the rest of his answer. But Jesus, the person, descending into Sheol, preaching to the righteous spirits of old, and then resurrecting himself on the third day, etc. So we can say God died in the sense that Jesus is God. He's the second person of the Blessed Trinity made flesh. But that doesn't mean God went out of existence. That doesn't even mean that Jesus went out of existence or anything. What it means is that Jesus, the divine person, second person of the Blessed Trinity, experienced the human condition of death, and thus we can say God died. Did you hear that little switcheroo there at the end? It's not that Jesus, who is God, died. Jesus experienced human death, presumably because it was his human nature that died, although he didn't exactly say that. And because of this experience that the eternal word had, we can say that he died. I would understand what he's saying as denying that Jesus died. What he's saying is we can say Jesus died, but in fact, Jesus did not die. His divine life went right on trucking as before. He didn't lose his normal functions, which he had had from eternity. So he can say that Jesus was fully divine and that no fully divine being has ever died, but I think he's implicitly denying that Jesus died. Dying and having an experience as of dying are not the same thing, right? But he continues. So I know that's a lot. That's a mouthful. 
but it requires some meditation and going through and to be able to articulate it. And here's a resource for you, BB. I would encourage you to get a hold to a book called Theology for Beginners by Frank Sheed. In that book, he explains with such clarity and precision the distinction between the two natures and how those two natures allow Jesus, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who is God, to experience things that go with being human and go and the things that go with being God. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident, um, I promise, it will be helpful for you. Okay, so he realizes that his answer doesn't really connect. He hasn't really said how it could be that God could die. But okay, read the book. Two natures, it's got to be in there somewhere, right? Sheed gives the solution. Well, okay. We'll have to take his word for that, I suppose. The last answer we'll look at is from an evangelical Christian apologist from an organization called CARM. His name is Matt Slick, and this is a question on the radio from 2015. When we talk about Christ's death on the cross, we'll always reference you know, him dying and resurrecting three days later. So can you comment a little bit on what exactly is it that died when he died? Is it accurate to say God died? Because I've heard you speak about the definition of dying, you know, a separation from God. Um, is it, you know, the whole God is strange from God idea, where God separated from God for a certain period, or is that inaccurate to say? So the doctrine of the Trinity is that there's one God in three distinct persons. God is eternally the Trinitarian Lord. That's what he is. Right. By the nature right. of him being a Trinity, he can never not be a Trinity. Therefore, there can be no disruption of the nature of God in a Trinitarian form. It cannot be, so to speak, that uh, one of the members of the Godhood, uh, Godhead separates by nature from uh, the other members, so to speak, and then you essentially have two gods, which can't work. Now, we're talking in anthropomorphic terms, because how do we describe this, what the Trinity really is? Well, we're already at a disadvantage, but nevertheless, that's why that cannot happen. Jesus Christ, when he was born, was born under the law, Galatians 4, 4, a little lower than the angels. So the first move he makes is to assert the Trinity. He just gives a standard formula. And by definition, this will imply that Jesus was fully divine. So he's put his stake down in the second of the three. He's not going to deny that Jesus was fully divine. So will he deny that Jesus died, or will he deny that no fully divine being has ever died? Let's hear him out. He emptied himself and took on the form of a man. That's Philippians 2, 5 through 8. So what basically happened is that the second person of the Trinity, the Word, became flesh. And what that means is he added to himself human nature. When we say he added himself to himself human nature, we don't say that he combined into a new third thing the kind of God-man blended thing, the way you'd put uh, red into water and you get a blended uh, thing. That's monophysitism, that a new third thing, that'd be monophysitism, that's a heresy. Uh, nor was it so, uh, the, the nature so blended that they could not be distinguished from each other, and that's Eutychianism. So I'm bringing this up because when we look at what the true doctrine of Christ is, it's called the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union simply says that in the one person of Christ are two distinct natures. There's one person, one person says, I am hungry, I am with you always. The one person says, I am whatever it is. I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm with you always to the end of the earth, I know your heart. The one person the, is recognized by the single person, I, Jesus, the one person. But that one person, the two distinct natures, the human and the divine nature. The man, Jesus, did not come into existence until the incarnation. Okay, there's a confusion here now. He just, he used the word Jesus for the whole for the combination of the two natures or the thing which now has two natures 
Now he's just used Jesus to refer just to the human nature. What came into existence through Mary was a human being. You can call that human being Jesus, and you can use another word like Christ or the Son of God or the Word or the Logos for this pre-existent divine being. You see exactly this distinction earlier in Catholic tradition, particularly the second and third and the early fourth centuries. Is he thinking that a nature here is just a property? No, he's talking about an individual thing that came into existence, a man. The man Jesus did not come into existence until the incarnation, until he was conceived. The human nature aspect did not come into existence. So we would say, technically speaking, the man Christ Jesus is not eternal. We would say the man, the human aspect of Christ is temporal, had a beginning. Then again, he refers to a nature as an aspect, and an aspect sounds like a property. So he's kind of splitting it down the middle there. Maybe all that he's saying is that the Son of God isn't called Jesus until this mysterious hypostatic union occurs, and then we start to call this eternal being Jesus. The divine word was eternal. So the eternal word joined with a new human nature and became the person we call Jesus. So this person, Jesus, has two distinct natures, the divine and the human. Now, there's a doctrine called the communicatio idiomatum, and that is the communication of the properties. What that means is that the attributes of both natures are claimed or ascribed to the single person. That's right. So the single person, claimed. I, says, I am hungry, I am thirsty. The single person says, I am with you always to the end of the earth. So the one person laid claim to both the divine attributes as well as the human attributes. Here he clearly seems to be taking the two natures to be properties. There's one being there, that's Christ. There's only one thing that says I there, that's Christ. And Christ happens to have these two different qualities, these two different properties. Of course, the difficulty there is it looks like nothing could have both of those. No human is going to be essentially immortal, but God is going to be essentially immortal. So then how could you be both? There's many cans of worms there that I'm not going to open up right now. This is in contrast to ancient tradition, where some writers pretty clearly divide up Christ's actions and words between the two natures. So that when Jesus says, I am hungry, they say that's the human nature who's saying that. And when he says, I am, that's the divine nature. And when he says, I forgive your sin, that's the divine nature talking. When he says he's afraid and he doesn't want to be crucified, that's the human nature talking. So you've got two talkers, two speakers, two selves. That looks like one too many. Okay, but Matt Slick doesn't have that problem. He's got one self with the divine nature and a human nature. Okay, but if he's got the divine nature, he can't die, right? Let's see if he can answer that. The single person laid claim and claimed the attributes of both human nature and divine nature. We see this because Jesus said, I am thirsty etc. I'm hungry. You know, I, I walk around and things like that. And also, I will be with you always to the, uh, to the end of the earth, Matthew 28, 18 through uh, 20. And uh, Father glorified me with the glory I had with you before the foundation of the world. So he's before the world was even created. So we see Jesus laying claim to this. Okay, now, on the cross, the nature of divinity is that it cannot die because death, in the sense that we're talking about on the cross, is a biological function. But the divine nature is not biological, so death does not equate with that. Now, this is, I think, confusing and confused. He's just pretty clearly said that Jesus is one being with two properties. Well, of course, a property can't die on the cross. But in Slick's view, Jesus is fully divine, and that includes immortality, indeed, essential immortality. So in Slick's view, this one man can't die because he's fully divine. What he said is that the divine nature can't die. Now we're back to thinking of the divine nature like it's a thing, like it's an immortal thing. And this immortal thing, the divine nature, is mysteriously united with a human nature, and it's the human nature that dies. But the human nature, to die a human death, must be a human being. But I thought there was just one Christ there. He goes on to say that Jesus, of course, did not die in the spiritual sense of dying. 
well, sure, Jesus wasn't a sinner. He's not truly estranged from God. About the kind of separation there was between Jesus and God when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Slick says this. So what extent was there a kind of a spiritual separation we don't know? And we should not say what it was because the Bible does not say. Well, yeah, the Bible doesn't say anything about the hypostatic union. And it also doesn't say that Jesus has a divine nature either. Biologically speaking, only the human nature died on the cross. Only the human nature died on the cross. The divine nature cannot die and did not die on the cross. Death in the biological sense on the cross is only of the human nature. Wow. Okay. So the human nature can't be a property, although he pretty clearly said it was an aspect of God. Uh, He must mean that Christ is a composite and there are two something like parts here. And so one part dies and the other part doesn't die. He's thinking of the human nature as a man. And that is the old view that you find in the church fathers. But, you know, there are too many Jesuses here. There's the man, and then there's also this eternal person. There are two selves here. The New Testament doesn't present two selves. The one Son of God is the one who died. The one Son of God is explicitly said to be a man and is always portrayed as a man. So if we have too many Jesuses and we have to choose one, we're going to have to go with the human Jesus. How exactly we deal with all these passages that people think is talking about somebody else, an immortal divine being that's eternally with God, that's another conversation. To his credit, Matt Slick brings up a couple of other hard questions for his view here and takes a crack at answering them. And that raises the question, if only the human nature died, then how is the sacrifice of divine value? And how could it be said that God died? Two the answer questions. is found in that doctrine I mentioned earlier called the communicatio idiomatum, oh! which says that this, the attributes of both nature are ascribed to the single person. So the person of Christ is what we see. If you and I are walking on the ground in a path and there's Jesus in front of us, we see the human being and we see the attributes of humanity in voice, in rationality, in his awareness of us and his awareness of himself, communication and things like that. We don't see the divine attributes unless they're manifested through the human. So if he were to walk on water, we would see the divine attribute manifested through the physical manifestation of being a human. Oh, wait, no, that's not a divine attribute. That's just a miracle. When Moses parts the Red Sea, that doesn't reveal the divinity of Moses. It's just that God has empowered him to do a miracle. And presumably that's what's going on when Jesus walks on water. Jesus mentions this a couple of times, you know, if it's by the Spirit of God, I do these miracles, and my Father working through me is the one doing the miracles. It's not suddenly pulling back the veil on Jesus' divinity. That's not the New Testament perspective. So when we see that Jesus died on the cross, we see that the person died on the cross. And what we're experiencing, what we can see, so to speak, if we're watching it, would be the divine, let's just say, manifestation through the physical. When he said uh, various things earlier about being with everybody always, that was him claiming the divine attributes in his personhood. No, Jesus is not claiming essential divine omnipresence when he says, I'll be with you to the end of the age. It needn't be read that way. But we experience a death of Christ in the personhood of the human personhood kind of thing as we look to the man and we see the man die. So what we're experiencing is the attributes of humanity dying physically. But the, the, the divine person, uh, let's just say, that I messed up there, not the divine person, but the divine nature did not die biologically. So there's a lot of doctrine that kind of weaves in here. But the thing is that only the human nature died on the cross, but since it was the person who died and the person had divine quality, therefore the sacrifice was a divine value. And by proxy, so to speak, we can say God died So, go back to my inconsistent triad. It seems to me that Matt Slick is using the word Jesus in two different senses. In one sense, he means it for the whole Christ. In another sense, he means it just for the human nature. 
So if Jesus means just the human nature, I think that he would agree that Jesus died and deny that Jesus was fully divine. And then he can agree that no fully divine being has ever died. I think that's what his view is. If Jesus refers to the eternal word, then I think his view is that the first claim would be false. It would be false that Jesus died. It's false that the divine eternal word dies. But it's true that Jesus was fully divine. So, if Jesus means the man, he denies the second. If Jesus means the eternal word, he denies the first. What if Jesus means the thing which is composed of these two natures? What if it means the whole I think then his view is it didn't die. However, it's said to die because the man dies. And also, the eternal divine word could be said to die because the human actually dies. And it's united to that. So he's applying this traditional policy of obfuscation, saying something that couldn't possibly literally apply to a being just because of how that being is related to something else something else which does satisfy that predicate. So if this thing can't die, but it's related to this other thing that did die, then we're going to say the first thing died. Now, about this, I could just let him have the ambiguity of the term Jesus and switch to the term the Son of God. So the Son of God died, the Son of God was fully divine, and no fully divine being has ever died. But the thing is, he might say that the Son of God is triply ambiguous in the same way. It could refer to the man, could refer to the eternal word, or it could refer to the whole that's somehow composed of those two things, of those two beings. In contrast to the other apologists we've examined in these two episodes, Matt Slick has an answer to this. His answer is that the term Jesus is ambiguous. On one interpretation, you deny one. On another interpretation, you deny another. Either way, you can remain consistent. My objection to this, and this is in the original presentation, episode 145, is just that there are too many Jesuses in this picture. There are too many selves in the Christ. The New Testament doesn't distinguish between Christ, the Son of God, and Jesus. Those are all just co-referring terms. Same with the Son of Man. Same with the Son of Mary. Same with the Lamb of God. Those all refer to the same single someone, to the same he. So the New Testament doesn't allow this distinction to be made. Catholic tradition does, though, at least elements within it. It's not just that the New Testament doesn't have this advanced technology of making this distinction. It's more than that. It's the entire portrayal. Jesus is a single character, is one way to put it. It's not one body that contains two souls. The reader is not given the task of figuring out when the eternal word is speaking and then contrasting that with when the man is speaking. The reader is not supposed to reason that sometimes the one is acting and sometimes the other is, right? Consider a demon-possessed person. Now, in movies, they make this distinction, you know, when the demon's talking, it's like this big, scary voice, you know, or it's speaking Latin or something or backwards Latin, or pig Latin, or I don't know what, but they change the voice when it's the demon talking. And then when it's the person, oh, help me, cast this demon out of me, it goes back to the regular voice. That portrayal shows you that there are supposed to be two selves there. There's the demon invader, and then there's the person who's the owner of the body. There isn't any hint, any gesture, any indication in the New Testament that you're supposed to discern two different ones within this body that's walking around in Nazareth, Palestine, Jerusalem, etc. There's just one guy. It's a human guy. He gets killed. He does amazing divine things because God is with him. God is empowering him. God has given to him his spirit without measure. How many Jesuses do you have in your theology? I hope your answer is one. Is that Jesus, the kind of being who can die? I hope you say yes, because all of the New Testament asserts that he died. And so then he can't have been essentially immortal like God. So that shows you that Jesus wasn't God himself. 
that also shows you that he wasn't divine in exactly the same way that the Father is divine. What about this idea of emptying? Is that going to help here? How about kenosis theory based on Philippians chapter 2? No, I don't think it does help here for a couple of different reasons. First, if you're trying to remain true to the ancient mainstream tradition, kenosis theory fails at that. Again, this is shown by Tim Paul in his book on incarnation theory called In Defense of Conciliar Christology. In asserting that the natures were unchanged and so on, they were asserting that the divine word had all the powers that he ever had. He had all the essential attributes that he had before. He didn't give up any of those. And of course, you can't give up an essential attribute and still exist. By definition, that's impossible. An essential attribute is one that a thing has to have so long as it exists. So they had to say that, of course. So it's not a way out here to say that Jesus just decided to give up his essential immortality. You can't give up an essential anything. If you get rid of the idea of essential immortality, a fully divine being is only immortal. Well, I don't think you can do that because it's greater to be essentially immortal. And also, the New Testament implies that God is essentially immortal. So then a fully divine being will have to be essentially immortal. So no, kenosis theory doesn't work. It's no help here to say that he lays aside the use of some of his attributes, like he lays aside the use of his essential immortality. I don't know what that would mean here. Again, you got the New Testament, and you've got Catholic tradition. Mr. or Ms. Protestant, I have a question for you. How Protestant are you? Are you willing to reform your understanding in light of Scripture when post-biblical speculations don't make any sense? I am. How about you? Now, if you think the traditional speculations about the two natures of Christ do give an answer, if you think they do show either which premise of my inconsistent triad we should deny, or how all three of them actually are consistent, let me know what you think I've missed. Don't just assert that that tradition supplies a solution. Actually show that it does. Maybe we'll all be the better for it. This week's thinking music has been the track I Dare You by Little Glass Men. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can hear or download that entire track. If you enjoyed this week's episode of the Trinity's Podcast, don't forget to share on social media such as Facebook, Twitter, or Pinterest. If this is something you love to hear every week, why not pitch in a few bucks a month? You can make a monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right-hand side of any blog post. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at Trinity's dot org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.